informatics, specialized in statistics at uh, University West Sweden. He has been combining teaching, research, and consulting for nearly three decades, and has published numerous articles in various disciplines. Dr. Gellerstedt enjoys applied research, which involves informatics and smart use of data. He is head of the SPSS Academy, a cooperation between University West and IBM slash SPSS offering courses in statistics on campus and online. He is also deeply committed to postgraduate education as chair of the subject committee postgraduate education in informatics and work integrated learning at University West. Uh, the title of his presentation is Work Integrated Learning and Learning Integrated Working, a Love Story Between Academia and Working Life. Welcome, Professor Gellerstadt. Thank you. Uh, let me start with uh, thanking uh, Najib for the invitation and also thanks for the nice presentation. I must say that I'm always a little bit embarrassed as a Swede when I get introduced like that. Uh, in Sweden we have more modest presentations uh, and uh, as a matter of fact in most situations I have to introduce myself so I'm a little bit unused with nice presentations like this so thank you. As a matter of fact I can tell you about a talk I had in Sweden I think it was two or three weeks ago or something like that um, I had to introduce myself and I started with a sentence um, hello everybody my name is Martin and I'm a statistician and uh, at the very same moment as I said that sentence I got a feeling of that that was some kind of confession nearly like some kind of AA meeting or something like that <laughs> hello everybody my name is Martin uh, and I'm a statistician and as, and as, as a matter of fact some guys in the audience actually responded, hi Martin, <laughs> I, guess, uh, I guess that these guys were statisticians as well. <laughs> and I think that uh, my feeling is related to the fact that there are a lot of prejudice about statistics and statisticians and, and prejudice among uh, I guess researchers as well actually. It's a little bit frustrating because Statisticians always think that statistics is, is the most fantastic thing you can work with. It's uh, uh, that numerical beauty is the Aphrodite of sciences or something like that. Statisticians always say that, that uh, as a statistician you get to play on everyone else's backyard and that's fantastic. You can do whatever you want and follow your interest. That's extremely interesting. But at, at the same time it's frustrating because most people believe that statistics is the most boring thing on earth actually. Um, maybe you have heard the story about who is the people who are becoming statisticians. Well, people who are becoming statisticians, that's people who are extremely fascinated in figures, but without personality enough for becoming accountants. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, I would say that prejudice are, are also for scientists. I mean, Google research or research, researcher and take a look at the pictures on Google, the 101st pictures. You will find a lot of lonely white coat researchers from natural science. And you will find some of them with some kind of uh, Einstein complex hairstyle like this, a little bit slightly mad or something like that. Take a look in popular media, Hollywood movies and things like that. You can see Doc Brown, Emerald Brown in Back to the Future and things like that. You gotta be a little bit crazy. Well, I'm not going to talk about prejudice uh, for all the, uh, the talk today, but I think it's important anyway to discuss this because this view of research and, and slightly mad natural scientists in white coats, I think it puts uh, researchers in social science and other dimensions in, in the shadow in some sense. Well, enough about prejudice. Uh, I'm going to talk about some experience from my journey from uh, being a math nerd to a fairly decent pracademician. Uh, that's uh, my term for combining being in practice and being an academician at the same time. I'm going to talk a little bit about work integrated learning, which uh, I believe is some kind of uh, uh, development of the triple helix model or some kind of similar model for uh, cooperating with uh, life outside the university. And I'm going to discuss how we have adopted that as a university profile and um, discuss some of the challenges. 
the beginning of my journey, ooh, this is uh, some errors with that slide, but that's supposed to be a lot of mathematical formulas. Um, <laughs> Does it matter? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, I must say that when I was wrapping up my, my bachelor in math, uh, mathematical statistics, I really enjoyed formulas, equation. I, uh, that's really the uh, emotion of uh, beautiful to see uh, these short equations explaining extremely complex phenomena and then down to a sharp equation, short like this, that gives me goosebumps still. I think it's an, an enormous emotional beautifulness in, in mathematical formulas. So I really loved playing around with equations. And, but at the same time, I started to get a little bit nervous, maybe slightly anxious as well. Uh, here I'm sitting playing around with all these formulas, but what am I going to work with? Is this work? This is just intellectual and puzzling uh, to have fun. Can I work with this? So in the end of my bachelor, I actually started my own consultancy business to try to see if anyone wanted uh, consultancies from a math nerd. And that was truly, truly shocking, I must say, to face reality. For the first time, I actually saw numbers. I mean, I've spent three years with uh, X, Y, Z and covering the total Greek alphabet as well in all these equations. But now suddenly I have to deal with numbers, with true figures. What should I do with this? I'm used to X, Y, Z. Everyone, everyone thinks that statistician is used to, to numbers, but I wasn't. And communication. Well, I started with uh, ISO 9000 quality control and things like that. And uh, uh, engineers were talking about uh, quality improvement while I was thinking about making uh, three factorial design possibly with interaction effects and things like that. So I didn't have the lingo, the language. And I didn't have a, a professional self-confidence either. Or maybe actually in some situation I have maybe uh, the vice versa, uh, too high uh, <laughs> professional self-confidence. Um, at one occasion I, I was supposed to meet uh, a rather well-known cardiologist specialized in heart failure, and some of my colleagues told me that, wow, are you going to meet that one? Yeah, 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 okay. And we had a meeting, and I noticed immediately that he recognized me as some kind of calculator only. He, was, he, he didn't want any intellectual input from me, he just wanted to do some calculations. And, and he told me that, well, I have studied a number of uh, patients with heart failure, and I have 15 variables, and I want you to find the most discriminating variable among these 15, and then you, I want you to find the cutoff level where I can say, beyond this level it's dead, otherwise it's alive. So find the most discriminating variable, and then a threshold for dead or alive. And I was sitting there thinking, that is the most imbecile research question I ever heard. That's ridiculous. I thought it's much better to raise the question, uh, which among all these 15 variables contributes to information about the probability of survival? And I hadn't the uh, diplomatic skills or humbleness or whatever to face that. I was so shocked that uh, he couldn't address a, a reasonable research question. He was so well known and I thought that he must be able to do this. But now I understand that he is well known and he knows everything about the body and especially the heart and things like that. But he isn't trained in multivariate modeling thinking, which is my strength. Uh, so now I'm much more aware of that I have some certain strength in my profession and he has some strength in his profession. And we got both of us much have, must have a mutual trust and to actually understand our, our strengths and weaknesses to, to be creative and successful together. So I, I lacked some kind of professional awareness, actually. Nowadays, I, I, <laughs> this is my, one of my business cards. And, uh, as you can see, I'm really proud of being an understandable statistician. I have skipped all the academical titles and so on on, on one of my business cards because uh, this is a strength among statisticians. Are you ready for another joke about statisticians? For, Okay. 
Uh, if you're in a conference um, facing statisticians, I wonder if you know how you can discriminate between an introvert statistician and an extrovert statistician. Well, when you're meeting an introvert statistician, he or she will be staring at, at his own shoes all the time, like this. When you're meeting the extrovert statistician, he or she will be staring at your shoes. That's the difference. <laughs> so that's, that's the reason for why I'm certainly I'm proud of being rather social and, and that I have developed communication skills over the years. And this is actually what I missed in, in my education. Uh, in my uh, bachelor degree, uh, I didn't have any experience of working life. We played around with uh, equations for three years. We didn't have any guest lectures. Well, that's a lie, maybe we had like two guest lectures or something like that. But these guest lectures, they didn't talk about how it is to, to work with math and statistics. They were also eager to show that they could handle formulas, so it was yet another three hours with playing with equations. I didn't have any project works with real cases. Uh, I didn't do any work with non-statisticians. I didn't have to explain my theory for non-statisticians. And when I started to teach statistics, I, I was thinking of, you must be aware of who you are teaching, if you're teaching becoming statisticians or not. And I think a common mistake among teachers is to teach in the same way as you have been taught yourself. But I, I, I've tried to change that, and I've tried to add a little bit more, uh, not only knowledge and understanding, but also a portion uh, uh, for competence and proficiency and judgment and approach. I think that the achieved knowledge will be higher if you combine knowledge and understanding with competence and proficiency, judgment and approach, the synergy effect. And how do I do that? Well, I'm still trying to uh, invest at least 20% of my time working outside the university. I designed the SPSS Academy, which is the most modern statistical education in Sweden. When I did the PowerPoint slide, I thought I was, must be a little bit humble, so I put the question mark after uh, the most modern statistical education in Sweden, but actually I think it is. Uh, I, I'm living right in the middle of two universities, one old-fashioned classical large university and one smaller university. And I've chosen to work at the smaller university because we are so close to the students and we are so close to other disciplines. We are working together interdisciplinary. And we also have this work integrated learning as a profile. And I, I, I truly believe that it's much more creative uh, environment for me. Uh, the SPSS Academy uh, was designed 2008 and I decided that the signum, the, the characteristics of the SPSS Academy should be that it must be fun to study statistics, to contradict the, the uh, normal misconception that statistics is boring. So fun, it must be fun. And I think that fun is the mother of curiosity, and I think that curiosity is the most important thing to foster among our students. And I think curiosity solves a lot of problems. I mean, for instance, yesterday I heard the problem with that we are creating replicas of ourselves in, in research and, and so on. But I think that if you really could foster curiosity, a really truly cur curious person finds his own ways as well, no, not only follows. And I also wanted to show that statistics is not that difficult and it's extremely practically useful. And I also wanted an online version specially adapted for working professionals who wanted to upgrade their competence for you know, transiting to a new job or increasing their job security or for other reasons. So I wanted it to be attractive for working professionals. And some rules for the SPSS Academy. I want the teachers involved in the SPSS Academy to actually be pre-academicians. Uh, at our university, I think it's the same all over Sweden, that you are allowed to work 20% beyond your uh, uh, normal uh, position at the universities. You're allowed to 
have your extra income in your consultancy business around 20%. Uh, you are allowed, I think that for the SPSS Academy, I think you are supposed to be involved in projects outside the university. And we're using state-of-the-art software. I completely banned uh, naked data. Naked data is data without any context. So it's not fun to calculate an average just for uh, the sake of the fund just to have some figures and calculate the average. That's not fun. You've got to know what the data is about and draw conclusion. You've got to transform it to the actual real phenomena. And we are focusing on statistical literacy to uh, interpretation and understanding rather than this mathematical masochism. Uh, we are doing a complete project together with the students from operationalization to find an interesting topic to study and the students actually the online students are suggest give suggestions over possible themes for a survey and uh, right now actually we are running a survey about attitudes regarding sustainable development and uh, so they are constructing the questionnaire together with us teachers and then they are collecting a number of responses each student collects 15 responses approximately and then we have a joint database and then they are writing, a, uh, doing the analysis and writing a report in the end. We have on our uh, learning uh, management system, uh, it's like a standard system with files, uh, submissions and things like that, and also a debate forum, uh, a discussion board like a chat, but we have also as a complement something called the work-related issues board, because when we started this online education, we immediately noticed that we got a lot of questions outside the scope of the course, more or less consultancy business questions. Hi, I'm working in the pharmaceutical business and I have a question about dropouts. Could you please give me a hint? Questions like that. And the first thought I got was, oh, am I supposed to be a consultant in my own courses now as well? But after some short thinking, uh, I decided to see that not, that's not a problem, that's a possibility to actually regard this as a learning possibility. So I started to have a special option on the home page, the course home page, called the Work Related Issues Board, where the, the participants are supposed to raise questions outside the scope of the course. It could be something they have read in the media or some problem they have at, at their workplace. In the end of the course, uh, participants receive uh, standard credits from the university, but they also receive a certificate from the university and IBM SPSS that tells them that they have some skills beyond the theoretics in statistics. So it's a cooperation between the university and IBM. We have had 1,500 online participants since 2008 and we have seen that 80% of them are working and that was our target population, working people. Most of them are working full time. More than 80% did use statistics in their current profession. The other ones wanted to do it. Actually, some statisticians have taken the course as well. And when I have interviewed these statisticians, they were, are in the same position as I told you earlier. They have studied all the equations, and, but now they want to learn how to communicate statistics and find another language. And the work-related issue board is extremely stimulating to get this a lot of input from different working places. We have engineers discussing total quality control issues and things like that. We have biopharmaceutical companies, we have marketing questions, we have people working in media. People from everywhere are raising questions and then we can see, we can have this kind of boundary crossing where people from other disciplines could see that we have more or less the same problem. We have the same underlying problem no matter if we are trying to detect changes uh, in, in heart rate or in changes in the stock market. Well, we can learn from each other. And students, I'm actually taking all these questions from work life on the RIB, this working related issue boards. I'm taking all these questions and also put them in the courses on campus. So the campus student can see that this is for real. Here is typical problems that are raised from people working. And I'm all, in the end of the course, I'm uh, uh, usually, as a complement to the standard questionnaires, I always ask my participants whether they found the courses interesting, uh, fun, and useful. 
and uh, if it was less or worse than expected, as expected, or better uh, than expected. And as you can see, the mood is better than expected, and I think that these kinds of measures are much more important for me than just measuring the number of uh, pass and failure and pass with honor and things like that. Because this is some kind of guarantee that my participants actually are going to use statistics in real life at their working places later on. So for me, it's much more important to know that they thought that this was useful and that it was fun and interesting. I have started to grow some kind of curiosity and shown that it's a useful tool. On a university level, you can see that we have adopted a systematical work with promoting students to use this synergy between workplace and, and theoretical knowledge. And we're also working a lot with professional development in the actual workplace, in projects together with the life outside the university. And we can see that when it comes to our course syllabuses at the university, 80% now of all course syllabuses actually includes a section which describes how uh, working life is put it into the course, how, we in, uh, how work integrated learning is implemented in the course. And we have done some studies as well and developed a taxonomy for what kind of work integrated learning uh, options that are implemented in the course. And we can have cases, case teaching, simulation, role playing, things like that. We could have something we call imprints, professional code, annual reports, guest lectures. We have tools that using the state of the art tools. And then of course we have field work. Uh, some of our programs, uh, bachelor programs is offered on a four year basis. So they are using one year spread over uh, the four year one year is with uh, paid internship periods during the bachelor uh, studies. And just giving these examples of how to implement work integrated learning in courses uh, to raise this and to visualize this for other teachers makes it more reasonable for others to adopt it. Even the more skeptical teachers could adopt. It's not that difficult to adopt these things. And we also have a rather recently started doctoral degree program in work integrated learning and I'm responsible for the one with or uh, the chair of the subject committee regarding the informatics specialized at work integrated learning. It started 2012 and now we have eight doctoral students. Actually we don't call them students, we call them colleagues, junior colleagues and we are senior colleagues and we are supposed to do research work together, some with more experience than others. So we want to integrate them in our work as well. So we want also the research education to be work integrated learning. And all these students are actually not studying how working life could be put into academia. They are actually studying how learning could be adopted on different workplaces. Uh, I, for instance, uh, supervise now one student who is paid 50% of the time uh, of, the, uh, of a hospital and she works 50% with her PhD students. So it's something we call an industrial PhD student. And she is studying uh, how, uh, for instance, personal learning environment, uh, uh, ICT tools could support physicians in their lifelong learning. A typical uh, PhD study a doctoral degree is uh, compromised of one and a half year of courses and 2.5 years with working with a dissertation research work. And it's typically supposed to be four or five peer-reviewed papers in that uh, thesis. This is maybe the most unreadable slide on the total conference. Uh, this is our way of working with discussing the progress for our doctoral students during their uh, doctoral program. Uh, we have in Sweden 19, diff 19 national goals, national objectives with the PhD education, which must be fulfilled. So it's 19 different objectives, and these are the rows in that matrix. And in the columns in the matrix, I will show you a, a closer view soon. In the columns, there are all, uh, some of the courses uh, included in the degree. And then we have also tried to operationalize the activities during the PhD 
studies. We have a number of courses and we can see how different courses are related to the national objectives to achieve uh, proficiency in, in, in uh, scientific research methodology and uh, a sp a specific research methodology in the specific field and so on. And we can see how different courses are related to the objective. If it's a weak uh, correlation, a uh, medium correspondence or a strong correspondence. And then we have a bunch of activities we have a planning seminar, which is, is supposed to be within the first six months during the, the doctoral uh, studies, where the doctoral uh, colleague are supposed to discuss the plans for the dissertation work. And then we have a mid-seminar, a final seminar, and then, of course, we have a lot of seminars running continuously. We have conferences, students, uh, our research PhD colleagues, are supposed to visit a number of conferences. And then we have discussed what's the aim with a conference, what is supposed to be, and, and what kind of maturity could a PhD student progress. And we say that, well, if the PhD student follows the supervisor hand in hand and make a, pres a presentation or a poster or something like that, then that student is on stage level one in maturity, hand in hand with the supervisor. On stage two, you're supposed to be on your own at the conference. And on, on stage three, you're a total professional conference visitor where you interact and, and, and develop networks and finding new references and have your own presentations. And maybe you have also been a reviewer uh, before the conference and so on. And then we have other activities, peer review activities, literature reviews, gathering data, analysis and synthesis. Uh, interaction with society and the work with writing the thesis in itself. So we have tried to figure out what's the different activities. Well, I mean, the PhD education is not only the courses, it's a number of activities as well. And then we have tried to map all the activities against these 19 uh, objectives. And the first four objectives are about knowledge and understanding. And the interesting part is that the following 10 objectives or something like that, is actually about competence and proficiency. And here we can see a lot of objectives regarding the ability to communicate your research results, the ability to identify gaps in the theory, to raise reasonable questions, and things like that. And it's extremely good that we have all these objectives. And we have tried to see how we could support these objectives with different activities as well. Well, speeding up a little bit. Uh, I definitely think that there is a love story between mixing work and, and learning. Uh, we have adopted it in education, in our doctorate program, in research and developing, development project, and we are also trying to be a facilitator when it comes to offering good uh, education for working participants, uh, online, blended, or on workplaces. Uh, our university is actually the university in Sweden with the highest proportion of first-generation students. Uh, no academical parents and so on. But anyway, we have success with having around 80% of our students are actually employed in their respective field within one and a half year. And that's a really good figure for taking account of the fact that we have the highest proportion of first-generation students and that we are in an area with a rather high uh, unemployment rate for the moment. When it comes to learning at workplaces, our doctoral students are using these theories mainly, or well, this is some of the theories which are used in, in the thesis work, uh, community of practice, uh, which is... Uh, rather static uh, theory, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, a lot of my students, when I discuss with them, uh, bachelor students, they say that, well, at the university I can learn the theories and then I have to work some years for learning the practice and then I'm ready in some sense. And we are, I mean, that's the community of practice to learn the informal knowledge and so on, to, to, to be familiar with the practice. But I want them to think in another way. I want them to think in a way that says that, well, in, at our university, we are mixing the theory and, and work. And we want you to be able to actually develop and be creative and be a reflective practitioner. 
to see how you could actually change the community of practice. Yeah. And I mean, it's not a good idea to think that when I'm ready at the university, I'm going to replace a person who is retired or something like that and do exactly the same work as he or she. That's not a good idea. You should develop the workplace. You should be innovative. I like the concept of community of innovation, which is how ICT could support innovation. It's, uh, I remember uh, 25 years ago when I worked with Total Quality Control, it was very much about visualization to, to show graphs and different uh, process diagrams and fishbone diagrams and so on for visualizing a creative process and to start people thinking about problems and progress and things like that. Now it's in, in, in some sense uh, the ICT corresponding idea with community of innovation. I truly like also the concept with boundary crossing, that as soon as you have a boundary object, that could be a course in statistics, for instance, uh, a course in statistics where people from different disciplines are working together and doing the same course, then you have these barriers between different disciplines, different cultures. Or it could be case report form at a hospital, for instance, which should be shared by nurses and physicians and so on, and different uh, professionals. And instead, uh, the, the idea with uh, boundary crossing is that instead of regarding these barriers as barriers, as problems, we can regard them as learning opportunities. It's, it's in these boundaries where we actually could learn something from each other. So that's an opportunity, not a problem. And of course, I also like the ideas with being a reflective practitioner. Um, yeah, five minutes. The crucial thing now in the love story is try to develop the I part in work integrated learning. How to integrate this work and learning uh, in an optimized way. We have tried to do it and we've done it now for a number of years, but now it's time to turn it up a little bit and actually try to optimize this. How could we foster this I part so that our students continue with integrating learning and work after they have left us at the university. And we hope that by adopting working life in, in, during their studies, the transition to working life will be smoother, but we also hope that they will continue to stay as reflective practitioner, practitioners and use the I part. And, and uh, thinking about what's I literacy, what's, what's the skills you need for being a good reflective practitioner. That's something we want to study and we'll start to study, do some research, trying different strategies for supporting the I part of work integrated learning. So the current challenges right now is to find to try, and try out optimized strategies for the interaction part between working life and learning and include that in our curriculum. And we have also now discussed very much that uh, our university must not only be proactive, we must also be reactive in the sense that we want to be able to respond on questions outside the university, no matter of the magnitude of the question. Even if it's just a small problem that could be solved face to face within one hour, we should have logistics for arranging that. It could be a round table discussion, it could be a seminar, it could be a five million dollar research project for many years. We should cover the total spectra. So we want to be reactive and that demands some changes in the logistics. And we have now discussed to have a bag of money for quick and dirty projects. I mean, working life are a little bit tired of us saying that, well, this is interesting and now let's go back and try to find some funding for doing a research project with this. We will keep in touch and within six months we will be able to tell you if we can do some work together or not. That's not a good idea. We want to have a bag of money to start to do something immediately and then we can get at least something out of, there, uh, out of it and then we can see if it's possible to do a research project of a greater magnitude or not. And we are also discussing how we could be more efficient when it comes to designing learning for organization. How could we optimize when we are using online or blended education or workplace learning so we got this uh, ripple effect. So it's not only the ones attending the course who get some extra material to put on the bookshelf or something like that. How could we involve so it's ripple effect in the total company? And we did one study some years ago 
where uh, an education covered 44,000 employees. And we have some good research results from that study showing uh, that uh, how uh, efficient online and blended education could be performed in, in rather huge organizations with many employees and things like that. But we're trying to develop that further to be even more successful in that area. Final conclusion that, that being a professional means that you have to the adequate knowledge and understanding and are trained in the current practice, but that you also are a reflective practitioner continuously integrating work and learning and contributes to developing the practice of tomorrow. That's what we desire, that's what we want with our profile at our university. Once again, thanks for the invitation for uh, being able to have a talk here in Orlando. It's slightly better weather, warmer than in Sweden. This is a, a photo from last weekend. Uh, many thanks.